and we're going to proceed with the hearing for Rutland Regional Medical Center. And I'm going to ask Kim if she could swear in the four witnesses from Rutland Regional. Would you please raise your right hands, please? I don't see Mr. Gregory, is it? Yeah, I don't I don't see Todd either. Oh, you can't see my camera? No. There we can. go. Popping up. There you go. Uh, now. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. That's okay. Do you swear the testimony you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. I do. Okay. So, Claudia, you can proceed uh, um, in whatever format you wish. <clears throat> okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, members of the board. We appreciate the opportunity to come before you and kind of tell uh, you've gotten a lot of our background information, financial information in advance, but we always appreciate this opportunity to add a little uh, color commentary and tell the hospital's story over the past year and where we see ourselves going come, going forward. Um, as I said, you're gonna hear from uh, Judy Fox. She's gonna lead off and, and really tell the hospital's financial story over the past year and what we project uh, more importantly, uh, where we see ourselves financially over the coming year um, in accordance to the budget uh, we submitted. Uh, following that, you'll hear from Betsy Hassan, our chief nursing officer, and Dr. Todd Gregory, our chief medical officer and the medical director of our emergency department to give you a little bit of a boots on the ground perspective of um, where we see ourselves on this uh, continuing ongoing war against the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and uh, I think you will find um, today, the budget we are presenting is a conservative budget. We worked really hard to have one that conforms to uh, the guidelines you administered. Uh, and perhaps maybe even though it's a little too conservative. Uh, because of the great uncertainties that we are facing, uh, given these uh, incredible times. Um, I'm sure you've heard from others and you will hear from us a little bit that this is uh, the most uncertain and challenging time that we have experienced in healthcare. In my 30 years in healthcare administration, um, that is true. Now, you often hear us, that's part of the CEO playbook, we talk about all the challenges and uncertainties. Um, but but this time is definitely unique. And I know you understand that. And I will tell you from the hospital perspective, we appreciate your understanding uh, and consideration. You have a job to do as our regulator. We understand that. But we also appreciate um, you really trying to understand the, some of the challenges we're going through in doing that. Um, so let me uh, start off. Do we have, um, how are we going to do the uh, slides on this? Well, generally the hospital themselves runs a slide deck, but if you need to, we could have Abigail or Patrick or someone from Patrick's team run the slides. It's up to you. Claudio, I can, I'll share my screen. Okay. Judy's going to project and we'll walk you through some of the deck we prepared. Perfect, thank you. Great. Okay. And so on the next slide, uh, the next slide following this, uh, we also have uh, included uh, in one of the side benefits of doing this virtually is we have members of our board and our uh, management team that are here um, uh, observing this and it gives us easier access. Um, but just to orient you, because uh, I, I know maybe some of these start blending together, uh, we are Rutland Regional Medical Center. We are an independent not-for-profit community hospital that serves about 60,000 uh, patients in the greater Rutland service area. We staff 144 beds. Uh, we have a workforce of about 1,700 employees and a very busy emergency department. Um, and a uh, fairly large and diverse medical staff. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, although a lot large part of the past year has been on pandemic response, 
uh, and crisis response activities, we still have had an opportunity to tend to some other very important business and planning work, uh, including um, we revised the hospital's mission, vision, and values over the past year. Last fall, we had a strategic planning retreat with our board where we revised our mission um, really to focus on uh, to improve the health of our community by delivering high value care through collaboration. And that is driving a lot of our work that we've done this past year uh, and going forward. One of the vehicles and one of the, the structures that is helping us in our mission that we are finding is our participation in the One Care ACO. Uh, it is helping us align with our other community health and social service partners in a way that we have some shared economic benefit and it gives us a vehicle and a structure to front load and redirect some funding from acute care on the back end to primary care, um, care coordination prevention on the front end of things. And why that's important for us and why our mission is so important is that Rutland Regional employs most of the specialty physicians in our health service area, but none of the primary care physicians. So, uh, and as you know, there are limited opportunities and uh, uh, ability for us to help fund some of these things and the, and the ACO has proven to be a great source of alignment for us. We've revised our vision and our core values, including last fall to adopt diversity and inclusion as one of the four main core values of our organization. Uh, and we recognize the impact of health disparities, and we are actively working to understand those in our service area and proactively address those. Our next slide, uh, we are very proud of uh, the work that everybody on the front lines of this organization, including behind the scenes, to uh, continue to focus on what matters in quality, and we received a lot of recognition for those efforts. And then on the next slide, we um, as you know, we've worked hard, uh, Judy and her finance team and everybody in our administration has worked hard to comply with budget orders over the over the past. Um, this organization uh, has historically had very good financial stewardship. Um, and we have seen the importance of that and benefited from that great work that has gone on for, many, many years, uh, especially over this past 18 months in our pandemic response. Having cash and having liquidity and having a strong um, balance sheet was essential for us to be able to protect our staff, protect our patients, and ensure this place uh, was open for those people who need critical care services. Uh, we are working more closely with our community partners uh, to advance healthcare reform in Rutland County. Um, and again, the ACO is working out well for this health service area. Uh, we are also very proud uh, that uh, we are um, leaders in mental health and substance abuse services. Uh, we are the only community hospital that provides a level one involuntary uh, psychiatric services through an agreement with the Department of Mental Health. Um, we have a longstanding inpatient psychiatric uh, service uh, and for about 13 or 14 years now, we've uh, provided the hub uh, medication assisted treatment program for people who are uh, suffering from opiate addiction uh, here in Rutland County and beyond. Um, and we consider ourselves a full service community hospital. We don't do tertiary care, but we provide a wide rec a wide spectrum of primary and secondary care services, including um, maternal child health services, a 12-bed intensive care unit that is staffed by uh, critical care providers that are dedicated just to the ICU. Um, we have a full medical and radiation oncology uh, service, um, and we provide the critical subspecialty services such as endocrinology and neurology, orthopedics, ENT, general surgery, um, just to name a few uh, for our service area. And on the next slide, uh, we've prepared our budget according to the following principles. 
Um, we really wanted to make sure that we were uh, had a budget that would safeguard our financial viability, um, continue to provide access to critical health care services in our community, um, and to make sure we're providing a safe environment for our staff and the patients who are receiving care, which is more challenging than ever over these past 18 months because of the stresses and the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on our population. We've tried to mitigate our rate increases um, and manage that. Um, uh, and also, um, as you can see in the budget, uh, we have not done a lot of cost cutting this year. Uh, we have basically are presenting you with a break-even budget, um, and we're trying to just hold the line on any new expense growth, but we feel it's premature at this point in time to make any substantial changes in our financial or operational position until we're able to get a little more clear picture of what the post-pandemic new normal is going to be for Rutland Regional Medical Center and our community and healthcare in the community. Um, so this break-even budget is not where we want to be, nor where we need to be long-term to be financially viable. But we feel due to this point in time and the uncertainty, it is kind of a um, break-even budget as a prudent budget that um, we can uh, kind of hold our own until we get through some of this more, most critical part of, of this. So I'm going to turn it over to Judy and have her walk you through the financial story of, of us as we look forward. So we'll start off on the balance sheet. Um, and this is where, you know, we really managed that financial stability of the organization. And what you'll see this year is a very stable balance sheet. And we'll talk about uh, the details here, but the most significant change is within our cash position and our liability position. And that really relates to our uh, paying back of the Medicare advance. Uh, those were the advance funds uh, that we accessed in the early days of COVID. Uh, we accessed $25 million. We expect in 2022 to pay the all remaining funds back and that's 18.2 million. You'll also see that we've got $360,000 or $360 million of assets, only about 24% of which are obligated through liabilities, the rest coming through um, in fund balance. When we look at our cash flow, again, that theme uh, of just uh, really focused on Medicare advance payments, that is the single largest change within our cash flow. In total, we expect our cash demands, our cash uses to um, outpace sources by $20 million, 18 of which uh, is related to Medicare Advance. You will hear of our goal um, and focus on annuitizing our pension plan. We think that's going to cost us about $2.5 million. Uh, and the rest is just really related to operations, principal payments, and working capital. Um, we are focused on uh, kind of future debt management. Uh, we are in the process of working with the USDA to transition about $34 million of debt from a variable rate to a fixed rate. That is something that will only help to strengthen our balance sheet. Um, and as Claudio said, we really need to limit our reliance on investment returns. Investment returns have subsidized operations over the last four years, um, and they will do so again in 2022. Uh, but we, we do have a focus on uh, where we're going to, to, to change that curve. Uh, and speaking of that, so our cash management over the last four years, our uh, margin accumulation, our operating margin accumulation has been $7.7 .7 million. Um, at the same time, our investments uh, grew by about 26%. It is that investment growth that subsidized operations and subsidized our ability to fund pension, to fund um, <clears throat> major uh, facility uh, improvements, um, and uh, uh, debt, debt. So um, we are again focused on that. Although you see uh, an increase in uh, investment growth, you really don't see much of a change in our cash position. 
Looking at the income statement, I uh, just want to focus your attention. And as we've said, this is a this is a break-even budget. Um, and just want to um, concur with Claudio. Uh, this by far has been the most challenging budget to put together. Uh, we have a basis that is not credible. Um, and so we are trying to understand uh, what historical uh, averages and performance looks like going forward. At the same time, we've had a resurgence of volume and uh, we're facing uh, staffing and labor challenges. So that all plays part in this budget. I'm gonna start right off uh, with our rate increase. So we are asking you for a 3.6% rate increase. Um, and ask you to, to look at that uh, over the last five years. And so our last five year uh, average rate increase has been 2.2%, well below the state's average. Um, and again, we're able to do that because we have used those investment terms, uh, 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 investment returns to subsidize our, our operations. When we look at how did we arrive at 3.6%, and I, I know you as a board have, have heard me say that um, you know, rate increases are becoming less and less efficient and less of a lever to pull to balance um, operating margins. Um, and, and here's kind of the backdrop. So uh, a 3.6% operating or rate increase uh, gets us $22.4 million of gross revenue. But what we collect on that is four and a half million dollars. Um, and so you can see that uh, the, the rate increase is becoming less and less uh, effective. Um, on average, it's about one point two million dollars per percentage point of rate increase. When we looked at how we would levy our rate increases, we certainly used all of the available information uh, that we had uh, new this year. Uh, so we used the federal pricing transparency. We also used uh, the state available uh, data as well. Um, and then know that um, in terms of our pharmaceuticals and supplies, our rates are really tied to acquisition costs. So those uh, inflation factors that we're all seeing uh, in, in accessing those supplies are certainly coming through uh, in the way in which we are charging for those services. Looking at gross revenue, so gross revenue, we go from a 21 budget of 578 million to a 22 budget of 639 million or $61 million increase. Uh, a little more than half of that is related to volume that we took out of our budget last year. So when we came to you last year, uh, we were concerned about uh, the, the stoppage of services uh, and the return of patients. Um, and so half of that uh, rate increase this year is coming back in and we are seeing that volume. And we've got uh, Dr. Gregory and Betsy Hassan who really talked to us about uh, how that is presenting itself to the patients in, in our organization. We've got the rate increase of 22 million and then very little uh, operational change outside of those two factors. You did approve a psychiatric renovation CON that we are uh, mid stride in that will offer us three psychiatric beds, uh, that's um, as soon as those beds come online, we'll fill them. Um, and we anticipate that those patients are being held in our ED by, uh, by large part now. Um, and then just new provider volume mix of services. Uh, we did anticipate, and I think this is probably something that uh, is going to change from budget assumption to actual uh, a decline in laboratory service due to COVID testing. Um, and then we do have a, an MRI uh, request that we just sent uh, to, to the board, uh, received that yesterday. Uh, we are having some issues with downtime in our MRI um, and really need to uh, work with you uh, on that CON. From a reimbursement perspective, uh, so this budget is predicated on the fact that every dollar that we charge, we are going to collect about 42 cents. Um, that is a decline of about 1% from where we were in our projection. Uh, so that from 44 to or 43 to 42, uh, that's equivalent of $6.4 million. Um, and there are some uh, pros and cons and um, you know, a net effect there of, of how we came up with that. 
Um, when we look at those individuals not participating at all, uh, that increases the net to gross by about $5.2 million or decreases. Uh, in our 2021 budget, uh, because of COVID, um, we had um, decreased our level two utilization. So those are the patients that uh, reside with us who don't have a medical diagnosis uh, that is um, eligible for a state or federal payment. Um, we have seen that cohort of patients uh, rise back up. And as we speak today, we have seven level two patients in house. Again, those are patients that there's not a revenue stream for. We expect that volume uh, that we're gonna have to write off and impact our bottom line by about $2 million. As part of the COVID waivers that the federal uh, uh, CMS program put forth, they did um, waive the 2% sequestration on outpatient Medicare reimbursement. Um, at the time we wrote this budget, we assumed that that waiver uh, would be um, uh, terminated and that we would be subject to uh, that uh, payment reduction again. We do have in-flight commercial contract negotiations and we have brought in to this budget, any changes in commercial payment rules. On the increase, uh, we will talk about revenue recognition and what that means um, that plays out in some of the um, metrics that you're looking at at bad debt and free care. Uh, but suffice it to say, we were able to bring in an additional $900,000 uh, because of revenue recognition. And then Medicare updates. We did include a 1.8% revenue uh, update on the Medicare outpatient program, 2.8 on the inpatient, and uh, there's no update on the Medicaid program. Um, and then we did anticipate, again, COVID testing. Uh, to uh, decline in the write-off related to that was $1.1 million. That is probably something that is way conservative and not something we'll realize. 24% of our revenue is at risk, and we'll talk about that. So 24% of our total utilization um, is uh, involved and related to uh, payment programs with OneCare. We participate in all of OneCare's uh, risk programs that they offer. Uh, that's the equivalent of about 25,000 covered lives. Um, when you look at our utilization compared to the state, uh, Rutland has about 9% of the state attribution. We are limited in how we participate in One Care, not because of the programs they offer, but because of our community providers uh, who participate or not in One Care. As we speak uh, now, uh, we only have uh, Rutland Community Health, which is the local FQHC who participates in the program. They are the only entities that can attribute patients. We have not included any uh, risk uh, in our budget, so there's no reserve or settlement set aside for risks in those programs. Um, and I would like to update, when we wrote this budget, we had assumed that uh, total risk would be about 2.7 million based on new attribution, new program profiles with OneCare, um, that 2.7 million is now 4.3 million. And again, none of that um, is considered as a reserve uh, in our balance sheet or would be uh, uh, reducing our operating margin or uh, net patient revenue. We have $20 million uh, in addition to uh, patient-related activities uh, that helps uh, fund uh, our expense and or um, in cases other than this year, operating margin. Uh, more than half of that, about 11.4, uh, relates to our 340B program. Um, and that is a program that we uh, try to maximize our participation in. Uh, we participate also uh, with the Medicaid program. Uh, that program participation is up for review uh, at the state level. We are partnered with other hospitals and uh, the hospital association to really understand any impacts that changes in that program uh, would uh, you know, provide to, to hospitals. And, and for us, that would be something that we would be very concerned with. You've also heard of all of the manufacturer exclusions uh, for those contract pharmacies that um, you know, we have uh, relationships with. Those exclusions continue to increase day after day, uh, has a real impact on our operating budget. 
<clears throat> from a federal CARES perspective, we are not assuming any additional federal CARES funding in our 2022 budget. Uh, we are also not anticipating that we will have to repay any of the CARES funding that we have received to date. Uh, we are obligated to uh, finalize and formalize our reporting to HRSA, um, of which we will um, uh, we will justify about $35 million of COVID funding across all programs. Looking at net patient service revenue, this is where I really want to, um, you know, work with you on uh, our basis for understanding our net revenue increases. As the board um, had um, announced earlier in the year using 2021 as a basis to understand whether we met the guidelines of the three and a half percent rate increase. Um, for Rutland, uh, that proved very difficult because we lowered our budget by about $28 million. So I'd really like uh, to invite you to think about our base a bit differently. Um, and if we use the 2019 actual performance in Rutland, which is the last year before COVID hit um, as a basis, and we increase that by three and a half percent, you know, through 2022, that's the blue line on the graph. Um, if you compare that to either our actual performance in 20 and are projected in 21, and what we're asking uh, of this committee to approve in 2022, you'll see that our net patient revenue falls below that trended three and a half percent if we use 2019 as a basis. With that in mind and layering on $20 million of other operating revenue, what that allows us is to have $291,000 million to support our expenses. Um, there is no margin as we've talked about. And in terms of expenses, um, although we have not uh, been um, solely focused on any cost reductions, we have been very focused on uh, really minimizing any new costs coming into the system. And although gradual, it is impactful. And I, I would draw your attention to expenses for adjusted uh, discharge, where you see year over year, we continue to improve that metric, meaning that our cost becomes less costly year over year as we compare that to our volume. When you look at our expenses, we go from 266 million to 290 million. Um, and we have prioritized our expense funding in our 2022 budget and our salary and benefits. Um, when we prioritized almost $16 million. And this is related to the labor um, challenges uh, the competitive environment that we are working in. As we speak today, we have about 210 open positions in our organization, half of which are nursing. Uh, we also have about 20, 25 asks of additional FTEs and temporary staffing that they've not been able to resource for us. So these payment programs we feel are vital uh, in order to retain and recruit staff. In addition, we have supply costs just related to that increase in volume um, or inflation, and we'll talk about inflation. We have also uh, prioritized some spending and IT costs, and this is really related to cybersecurity uh, and really shoring up our IT systems to uh, make sure that we uh, are, are in a solid standing. The healthcare provider tax, I, I, I don't need to talk to you about, you know, that's a 6% ta uh, tax. And then we did have minimal cost savings come through uh, related to our commitment and the uh, medical office building CON where we said we'd lower lease expenses, we did. There's some restructuring of some physician fees and, and such. Uh, from an expense standpoint, you've asked how much of that expense growth is related to uh, inflation. Um, I would like to say this is not a perfect number. This is our best estimate based on um, how we know uh, our acquisitions costs are changing and based on some fairly reliable information from our group purchasing uh, provider. But uh, $9.3 million uh, is our inflationary um, impact. If we were to say that rate payers are responsible for inflation, we would have asked you for a 7.4% rate increase. That's what inflation, that's how inflation would drive 
uh, rates. Uh, we have had the, you know, the the increase in uh, patient volume, which will subsidize some of this uh, inflationary cost. But just know that that piece is there. And you're seeing it in areas um, that should be consistent with everything you're seeing with all the other hospitals around wages, uh, drugs, um, contract staffing. Uh, our latest, uh, just yesterday, we received um, a contract for a contract staff ICU nurse at $195 an hour. That's what we're talking about in rates. Um, and similar to our expense metrics, our staffing metrics um, also are, are uh, well maintained. Um, we start with a budget of 1292 um, and, and get up to a, a little more than 1300 FTEs. When you look at that uh, in a FTE per occupied bed basis, uh, again, uh, we're really able to maintain that productivity level. Um, and again, just looking at those open positions, um, we are uh, in a in a point where we are um, having to expend significant amount of salary uh, to incent our staff to come in and take care of patients. Last month in the ED, uh, ED volume was up 15 percent. Uh, that is that is new. We hadn't seen that uh, in previous months. Um, and when we wrote this budget, uh, our inpatient census was lagging, lagging by about 2%. Last month, every day of the month, we had 10 additional patients more than our budget uh, had predicated. And what we're seeing is acuity, and Dr. Gregory will talk to us about this, but acuity is up as well. Um, and so in part, this uh, you know, uh, productivity is, is being managed by just lack of staff, and um, that's not necessarily appropriate. From an operating margin perspective, um, I really want to uh, focus on 340B revenue uh, and how that is um, really subsidizing Vermont hospitals. Um, and if you look at the middle set of, um, of, of numbers and graphs is our operating margin, just as we present it before we start carving anything out. To the right um, is our operating margin if we didn't have federal cares or we didn't have 340B. Uh, notice the significant change um, and significant uh, you know, loss in, 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 uh, in revenue uh, from uh, not having 340B. The second graph at, um, at the bottom of the page is our margin. So that brings in our investment income as well. Again, just taking your mind's eye to uh, that uh, for the set of uh, metrics on on the right, the total margin without cares or 340B funding, uh, in some cases we wouldn't have a margin, uh, even from a total margin perspective, if not for 340B. Capital uh, funding. So we have uh, $12.6 million of um, what we feel is available cash to support reinvestment back in our organization. I will tell you, this is one of our cash flow mitigating uh, strategies here. It has been our strategy to invest 1.2 uh, times our depreciation. This is held equivalent to depreciation. Uh, we'll fund 60, uh, about 60 individual projects. We do have money set aside for the MRI replacement that we've requested funding for and is, as an as emergency CON. Uh, by the way, just to put a plug in there. And then the new piece here is $2 million that we've set aside um, to support what we call service line assessment. This is efficiencies that we know that we can't operate on a break-even margin year over year, but we also know that our plant uh, needs to, to be redesigned, whether it is bringing in care delivery changes, patient flow changes. Um, and so we've set aside a bucket of money to support that very disciplined uh, kind of reinvestment that will drive efficiency. In terms of risks, um, you know, volume, is it gonna stay? Um, are, are these patients uh, here for the long term? Um, 10 additional patients over our budget, is that something we should expect going forward? What's the impact of this uh, next wave of COVID? Should we expect changes there? Uh, one care participation, we are all in 
Um, but we still don't know what is the risk corridor within the corridor. Are we uh, participating at 100 percent? How will our attributed lives change? Our community partners have until August 25th uh, to. Uh, I'm listening to a meeting, Ellie. To agree to participate. Uh, so that could change. Um, and then. So, uh, Judy, I hate to interrupt, but if I could just ask whoever it is that uh, has the background noise to mute themselves, we really need to hear everything that Judy has to say. Thank you. Um, and then uh, even updated from from this submission to where we are and still not final, you know, our maximum risk could be as much as 4.3 million when we look at uh, one care projections and then labor management. So our turnover rate right now is 16 percent. That's a double of what we had seen pre pandemic. Um, <clears throat> continued dependence on temporary staff, temporary staff now that we can't find. Um, and then we're awaiting labor salary surveys, uh, really to look at where our uh, salaries uh, compare to um, our peers um, in, in our region. And then we do uh, have a union contract that expires on September 30th, and we are in negotiation uh, with that. So with that, I'll kick it off to Claudio, who will talk about some opportunities that we see before us. So despite all the challenges, we do have some opportunities we see and we're looking to pursue over the coming year. Uh, one is to continue, uh, probably first and foremost, to continue to strengthen our relationship with primary care. Uh, as we move and make the move towards value-based care and payment reform, that is critical to our success and effectiveness in that. Um, again, we are making some uh, good progress uh, on that over the past year since we've both gone into the Medicare program together. Um, we are doing uh, great work. We have jointly hired a director of population health for our community. Um, and uh, they are focusing, uh, their team and our team are working really well together to focus on um, how do we use data to really manage how we're are performing and where the opportunities are. Um, and we are working more closely, I would say, with the other Rutland Health and Social Service Agencies than we ever have before. Um, and we're also trying to put in the structural things to support effective decision making. Um, and again, I will tell you, uh, you know, uh, being part of One Care has been the catalyst uh, that has helped us align our incentives, align our focus on this important work. We also adapted very quickly to technology, telehealth, and, and so forth during uh, the 2020, uh, early 2020 initial experience in the pandemic, and that work. Um, what you know? What are those programs that are actually producing results that we can measure uh, and improve the lives of our patients and reduce the cost of care? Um, and so we're doing some great work in that area. And then uh, here is our big challenge: we are torn more than ever at this juncture. We feel, uh, especially the senior leadership of the organization and all leadership, we feel a real compelling need to get back to the routine planning and operational work that we put off during the crisis response phase of the pandemic. However, we are back in a crisis response phase right now. We are seeing um, patients flood back to the hospital since the May uh, governor lifting the restrictions. Patients are returning and getting things that they've put off for a long time. Um, so we're trying to manage all of that, look at how we will go back into providing increased amount of testing 
and uh, perhaps booster shots now for our community while managing all those still managing that influx of patients that put off their elective care, which really we're finding um, isn't really that elective after all. If you have um, an arthritic hip that's limiting your mobility and quality of life, or you're having, you put off that screening colonoscopy. Um, and so, but we are trying to strike that balance and do some important planning work about the services we're providing, about um, how our labor costs compare to other hospitals, um, focusing on recruitment, how are we spending capital? Are we getting some type of return on efficiency on that uh, and so forth? Uh, how are we leveraging our, our you know, increasing every year investment in uh, inf information technology? Uh, and how do we make sure that um, we de-risk the balance sheet and manage the pension obligations that we have? So uh, if you look to, um, I'm not going to dwell on this. This is some of the our response to COVID-19. Um, last year, over this past year, uh, we've had a kind of mantra and a mission that we put in place uh, for the organization. Uh, first and foremost, protect our patients, protect our staff, and ensure the operational capability of this hospital. Through a lot of this effort, you can see on this slide, the following slide, um, some of the safety protocols we put in place. And then the third slide, um, ensuring operational capability. I think we successfully accomplished that. Um, we delivered over 50,000 vaccinations to our community. Um, we've developed surge capacity for not just Rutland Regional, but for our region. Um, and uh, and again, we thought that today's meeting with you, we this would be behind us. Um, but as you're going to hear in a minute from Drs. Gregory and Betsy Hassan, we're right in the thick of things and then some of the more uncertain times that we've had. So our focus right now, where we are at this point in the time going forward, is really focusing on retention and recruitment. Secondly, the safety of our staff and residents. And third, supporting our staff and our medical providers through this incredible period. So I will turn this over to uh, Betsy Hassan, our chief Nur nursing officer, who's gonna talk to you a little bit about uh, the state of the union of our nursing workforce and some of the other uh, work we're doing in COVID response. Thanks, Claudio. Good morning, everyone. Um, Mr. Chair, members of the board, um, as Claudio mentioned, I'm Betsy Hassan and I'm the Chief Nursing Officer for Rutland Regional. Uh, today, I'm going to speak with you a little bit about our nursing workforces and the resources that they need. First off, uh, just about myself, I'm someone who was born at Rutland Regional Medical Center and I've always known what a great community we have. I did leave Rutland to pursue higher education and was fortunate to find a career that provides boundless professional opportunities and the privilege to care for those in need. Early in my career, I grasped opportunities for clinical growth while obtaining specialty or certifications and graduate degrees. But as life moved towards starting a family, Vermont was the only place that we wanted to live. There was one important factor in choosing where to work though, and that was that I wanted to work for a magnet designated hospital. What magnet designation means to a nurse is that an organization is committed to high quality, patient-centered and evidence-based nursing practice. It also signals an organization's commitment to nursing professional development, and the expectation that nurses are collaborative leaders within the care team. And I'm proud to say that RMC has achieved its third magnet designation in December of 2020. This makes us one of 146 three-time designees and only one of 548 designees worldwide. This was a really bright spot during the pandemic uh, for our nursing staff and the organization. Our community is the reason our staff come to work every day and serving Rutland County is the core driver to the work that we do as an organization. Um, and it's not because it's easy, but it's because it's necessary. This drive is what powered our team through COVID. We are proud to be the place of safety, aid, and care during an incredibly uncertain time. And everyone did whatever they could to care for our community. Similarly to the global stage, our nursing staff and healthcare workers have been recognized as heroes during the pandemic. While surges in case rates may have been different in Vermont, the pandemic took a profound emotional and mental toll as staff faced a continuously changing care environment 
while worrying for their personal health and their families. The pandemic uh, also exacerbated the existing stress that's caused by inadequate staffing and workplace violence. COVID also exacerbated the challenges that we face in maintaining the staff that are necessary to enhance the care experience. Maintaining ANCC magnet designation and the safety of our care environment requires qualified and available staff. The challenges that we face, as Judy mentioned, is a nurse turnover rate of 16% and national predictions reach an estimated 22% by the close of the pandemic. It takes an average of 78 and a half days to fill a nursing position. We have traveler billing rates exceeding $130 an hour, which is over three times the amount our staff make. And also, as Judy mentioned, we're now seeing requests for $195 per hour for ICU staff. Our educational systems cannot produce enough nursing graduates to meet our workforce demands, and our nursing staff bear the workload of continual orientation and student learning, which is not adequately reflected in their workload demands or their compensation. Our staff have validated our concerns this year through our employee engagement survey, and 69% of our nursing staff scored the statement, my work unit is adequately staffed as unfavorable or neutral. We also to see a continual rise in aggressive patients with just over 133 instances of employees being injured by patients this year, causing some of our nursing staff to leave the bedside permanently. These indicators point to an unsustainable work environment and it's not conducive to a positive or safe patient experience. We invest an incredible amount of resources though to sustain our workforce. We have initiatives like a grow your own program for our LNAs and RNs, which in includes full tuition support to over 20 employees with work agreements to become nurses to Castle University and Vermont Technical College. We have active affiliation agreements with nursing schools at Castle University, Vermont Technical College, Norwich University and Adirondack Community College. We're hosting an on-site licensed nursing assistance program in partnership with the Stafford Technical Center, which is an accelerated program for 10 of our current employees to become LNAs in just eight weeks, and it's fully funded by us. We've developed a new OR and training program, which is a simulation-based training program for operating room nurses with the aim of shortening their orientation and onboarding time from a year to about six to nine months. We've also been able to increase the number of orientees in this cohort from orienting just one person per year to now four. Recognizing we need to support new graduate nurses, we have a new, new graduate nurse residency program, which is a year-long evidence-based mentorship program, and this supports them as they transition from students to practicing nurses. This has also been proven to enhance retention. We've invested in a workplace violence de-escalation training program called PROACT, and this is really to help staff develop the tools uh, in preventing harm from escalating patients. We've instituted sign-on bonuses for newly hired staff ranging from five to $20,000 based on their experience and specialty. And these all come with retention agreements as well. We've also looked to international nursing placements and these are uh, extended contracts for two years with international nurses in the hopes of bringing them into the community and integrating them to here. Um, right now we're sponsoring some from the Philippines. And then we've also taken a concerted effort in recognizing that embracing and promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion has the ability to increase our recruitment and retention efforts. So we formed a DEI committee with representatives from our frontline staff to our board chair, and this committee has developed a multi-year DEI strategic plan that includes goals for our workforce, equity and care, leadership development, culture and organizational support, and our organizational brand. As part of that plan, all leaders and staff have completed implicit bias training, even throughout the pandemic. We took a visible stance within the community in support of DEI efforts, such as the I Love Rutland All Are Welcome Here campaign. We've partnered with the Pride Center during Pride Month for various events. We raised the Black Lives Matter flag. We have a focused DEI Arts in the Humanities book club. And we focused on education on LGBTQIA care in the emergency department, just to name a few of those initiatives. This is an evolving work effort and it will continue, but our staff have shared that they feel an improvement in our work environment uh, in this area. And in our, in our employee engagement survey this year, we've increased our scores from 2019, and we also now exceed the national healthcare average for this. So these initiatives cannot offset the pandemic's impact on the workforce, as we now has a, have over 100 open nursing and su nursing support positions for hire. The lack of staff and lack of available contract or traveler staff places an additional hardship on our direct care employees and their leaders. In order to provide safe patient care, we've instituted premium pay programs to incentivize already overworked staff to work more. 
In December of 2020, we were uplifted with the hope as we administered our first of over 50,000 COVID vaccines. There was a glimmer that we were on our way out of an incredibly stressful year. But as the fall approaches, we're wary of the impact that the unvaccinated population and the Delta variant could have on our community and our workforce. Protecting our workforce from the threats and impacts of inadequate staffing and workplace violence requires resources. The adequacy of our financial resources determines our ability to provide a safe, high quality and efficient patient care for our deserving community. After an insurmountable 18 months of the pandemic, it cannot be ignored that the healthcare system is dependent upon the profession of nursing. While gestures of goodwill and praise as heroes provide some level of appreciation for a tremendously difficult job, we need to support the nursing profession through much more. We need to invest in the workforce, increase educational opportunities, and provide resources that create and establish an environment of physical and psychological safety. As a healthcare organization, it will be imperative that we have the financial flexibility to respond to the demands of our workforce and community to ensure safe, high quality patient-centered care that can only be created by a supportive work environment. The reason I come back to work every day is the same as why our staff do. It's an honor and privilege to serve our community when they're most in need. So we're asking for support to ensure that we have the resources necessary to create this environment and we'll continue to be proud to work in it. Thank you. Dr. Gregory. Thanks, Betsy. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a privilege to speak with you today. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I am, as Claudio mentioned, uh, an emergency physician here at Rutland. I've been here for 14 years uh, and I've served the institution as a medical director of the emergency department for 10 of those years. Uh, I was recently uh, asked to serve in another capacity as uh, the chief medical officer. Um, I want to speak to you about the efforts that we are undergoing to ensure that we continue to provide best quality care uh, to patients in our community, not only in the emergency department, but institution wide. And just to allow you to sort of ballpark this, I'll provide you with some figures. Um, between the emergency department and our clinics, uh, we provide uh, patients and families with uh, over 126,000 visits per year. Um, we do over 6,000 surgical procedures a year, and those numbers obviously were off uh, substantially and significantly during uh, COVID. Uh, the ED saw a reduction in census of around 24% on average, but as high as 48%, and our clinics were off between 4 and 40%, depending on the month. Uh, and our surgical capacity uh, was reduced because of uh, the mandated closures, as well as some capacity issues around staff. And so we were able to provide services at uh, a reduced rate and uh, about 16% off of, of you know, what we would predict. Uh, we're trying to make that up and we're working very hard to do that. And as a consequence in the emergency department, we're seeing uh, on a daily basis uh, between two and 20% uh, more than we are uh, staffed to see or equipped to see in our clinics two to 25% over. Uh, and our surgical colleagues are committed to making up all of those procedures uh, that were not done during COVID. And that is, uh, again, a substantial number of procedures uh, in a fairly short amount of time. So we're over capacity. And unfortunately, that is complicated by the fact that we have, uh, as Betsy alluded to, a reduced uh, clinical and office staff in almost every area of the hospital. Uh, we've lost staff to uh, illness, retirements, and just moving on to different uh, uh, opportunities. Many have left healthcare entirely. Um, at the same time, we're seeing higher patient acuity, which I'll speak to in a minute. Uh, some of that uh, results from patients not receiving care during COVID, and some of it we frankly can't account for. Um, perhaps most impactful is the greatly reduced community capacity uh, to provide support to patients coming out of the hospital and otherwise. Uh, and that has particularly affected the extended care facilities in our area. Uh, psychiatric uh, facilities uh, in the state, including the Brattleboro Retreat, um, and our primary care colleagues are seeing a similar increase in volume. Their urgent care center is seeing 130% of their sort of budgeted capacity. So they really don't have the ability to provide uh, sort of more service on top of that. All of their working, uh, you know, very hard to do their best. This has resulted in uh, increased holds, for example, in the emergency department, uh, where we hold uh, medical med surge, uh, medical and surgical patients, as well as psychiatric patients. 
We use NEDOC, which is a nationally validated measure of emergency department crowding and is clearly correlated uh, with uh, outcomes such that increased crowding has been demonstrated repeatedly to uh, correlate uh, directly with uh, reduced uh, outcomes and uh, increased mortality. Uh, we are overcrowded in the department now 75% of the time, and of particular concern, uh, the two most uh, concerning categories of crowding, severely overcrowded and dangerously overcrowded, uh, we see that 44% of the time. Uh, so that significantly impacts our ability to deliver care, um, and is something that is of great concern to us. Uh, I think the point I'd like to stress is uh, what Betsy mentioned. Uh, our medical staff, uh, our clinical staff involving our nursing staff, our technical staff, and really our staff at all levels are being asked to work harder, longer every day uh, to meet the needs of our community. Uh, we really don't see an end in sight. This has been impactful uh, in a number of ways, and uh, I'd like to speak to the acuity that I mentioned uh, earlier. Um, I, as I mentioned, work in the department, and I will tell you that I've made more primary uh, cancer diagnoses in the last three months than I had in the 24 months previous to that. Uh, that results from a lot of issues, um, some of them, of course, patients not being able to follow up or see their primary care providers during the pandemic. Others are, um, you know, really unaccountable, um, but it's very real for patients and it's very real for families. Uh, we see more patients with complications of diabetes and stage liver disease and stage renal disease than we are used to seeing in the department and elsewhere, and the impacts of that long term on the healthcare system are significant. We have patients needing elective procedures, um, and they have, as both Betsy and Claudio mentioned, experienced significant delays. This can be things like screening colonoscopies, uh, it may be surgeries uh, that are considered uh, under normal circumstances elective, but these are patients who have real needs and uh, suffer pain, uh, inconvenience, and uh, risk of increased dysfunction because of the delay in getting these procedures. Uh, and we're also seeing a greatly increased number of patients with acute mental health needs, especially uh, pediatric patients, with it, which is of a particular concern to us, um, and patients with uh, substance use disorder and opiate use disorder. Excuse me. Um, importantly, uh, those numbers probably are even worse than we uh, appreciate. Uh, we know that uh, heroin uh, and other opiate-related uh, overdoses increased 38% during the pandemic. Uh, most of those did not make it to our emergency department or other hospitals. Uh, and we are seeing many more patients with complications of substance use disorder, and particularly opiate use disorder, including cellulitis, deep space limb infections, uh, spinal abscesses and uh, cardiac infections, endocarditis. Um, and again, those have very long uh, term and significant uh, <coughs> consequences, excuse me, for the patient in the healthcare system. We're seeing more psychiatric patients who are suffering with instability secondary to uh, issues around their medications, uh, inability to get them, inability to have their medications regulated uh, by a provider as they normally would. Um, but also unstable housing, unstable family environments, uh, and unstable employment. Uh, and again, those all impact uh, us here in the Emerge Department, our institution, and our community to a great degree. Uh, on a positive note, uh, recognizing this, we have made efforts to do what we can. Uh, we, like some other Emerge Departments in the state, have an active uh, medication-assisted uh, treatment program. And we do this in uh, partnership with Turning Point, which is a local addiction and recovery service. So we're able to provide uh, patients who are interested with Suboxone out of the emergency department. And the important part of that um, is that we're available 24-7 to do that. Uh, Westridge is, um, as you've heard previously, a very good program here in Rowland, but it's not open 24-7. And uh, so there are plenty of patients that just can't make it there or choose not to. And so we are uh, now available to them. Additionally, we're supporting Rutland Mental Health, who has uh, received state funding for a crisis response team, and this is uh, targeted specifically at pediatric patients with acute mental health needs. And our hope is to treat them in a setting that is not the emergency department uh, so that they are more comfortable, safer, feel more secure, and we can hopefully get a, a plan in place around them that doesn't require them to spend um, time in the emergency department. And I will tell you that we have seen pediatric patients with acute mental health needs spend um, over a week in our departments. Um, 
not infrequently. Uh, and that is not a good setting for any patient, but uh, a particular concern is the effect it has on pediatric patients who, again, are already in mental health crisis. Oops. Um, finally, I'll speak to our sort of workforce issues uh, from a physician standpoint, but I would just like to stress that this really does apply to all of our uh, clinical staff, um, nursing staff, technical staff, and our, and our um, clerical staff as well. Um, there are uh, increased uh, reported feelings of frustration, exhaustion, and burnout. It's frankly very difficult to reconcile uh, the needs of our patients, families, and communities with our own needs um, as providers. Um, trying to advocate for reasonable work-life balance, time with our families, time to rest, relax, and recharge uh, with the needs that we're facing is um, really, frankly, it, it seems like an impossible task many days. We've lost providers to relocation and retirement. Uh, this has affected our orthopedic service line, cardiology, pulmonary critical care, endocrinology, ENT, and GI, uh, and we're having recruiting difficulties, and we're learning repeatedly it's not because of who we are as an institution. It's because we can't, for example, find uh, potential physician staff, potential nursing staff housing. Um, we can't find them childcare, and so we continue to have to try to fill gaps with locums physicians, with travelers, as Betsy mentioned, um, at uh, greatly increased rates. And we know, for example, that our travelers who um, previously might have left here and had five or 10 uh, options to them, they now have hundreds. And so um, it's not hard to understand where that price uh, sort of pressure comes from. To end on a positive note, I do want to reassure you that we are working hard to uh, support our provider and staff wellness. Um, we've had uh, initiatives here in the emergency department, uh, as well as on, on uh, other units and uh, to support other service lines. We have a wellness campaign right now to support our medical staff. So we're doing our very best to ensure that we carry everyone forward in a safe and supportive manner to allow us to provide the care to our patients and community that, uh, that they need. So. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, um, folks, uh, we uh, I, I know in some parts we're preaching to the choir because you've heard from some of our colleagues, and I know we've talked and you've asked us these questions throughout the past year, how we're doing. Um, the challenge that we have, we are very fortunate to be in Vermont, and we're very proud of the way our state pulled together our community, our leadership, our uh, elected officials uh, really pulled together and we're an example for the nation. However, it's a little bit deceiving because we've done so well, we just wanna make sure that people understand the incredible challenges that are happening here in the hospital. Um, this is a more uncertain time and a more challenging time in this uncertainty uh, um, wave of the pandemic than we've ever had before. And um, I think the challenge and the stress on all of us is, you know, all businesses are going through this. We're not unique, right? And everybody's feeling this in our community and every business is. The challenge is when, you know, a local restaurant or a store, it's a tragic thing and it's an economic challenge when they can't find enough staff, they can reduce capacity, not staff that section of the restaurant or close. We can't do that, especially in a rural hospital like us. Um, as a practical matter, diversion is not an option. If we close beds, people end up just going, it's the balloon situation, right? They end up stacking up in the emergency department and impact our ability to do that. So our staff have pulled together and recommitted to what we need to do and have done some heroic things shift by shift to make sure uh, that we are there and we are there for the community and that when you need us, we will take care of you and you will be safe. Um, we're a little bit, as you can see, we're a little bit haggard. We're a little bit uh, um, challenged and a little bit uh, dejected that we're back at this again. Um, but we just wanted to make sure that we're also telling our story that things are not normal here in the hospital and we're struggling to try to 
continue to find our, our, our new normal. And we appreciate your understanding of that. So um, with that, uh, uh, that is our presentation and we'll turn it back to you, uh, Chair Mullen. Thank you very much, Claudio. Um, we're gonna start our questioning off with board member Maureen Yusufer. Maureen. Uh, thank you, and thank you for the presentation and all that you are doing through this crisis and, and all the time. Um, I really appreciate um, Judy putting together all the financial statements and including them, you know, in the presentation. And, you know, I'm really going to work off of those statements. And, you know, starting with the balance sheet, you know, can you talk first a little bit about um, the COVID money that you received, how much is left on the balance sheet? Um, and then can you also address how you accounted for the capital purchases um, through the fund balance account and how much that was? Sure. So um, as of the projection um, in uh, 2021, um, we will have no funds left for COVID. Um, we anticipate that through the required uh, reporting through HRSA that we will justify all those funds, if not through capital or expense, through the alternate uh, uh, lost revenue calculation. There are no funds in 2022 either. Um, we did use capital uh, or access COVID funding for capital for things like um, negative pressure rooms, laboratory equipment, some building modifications. I mean, I think that was right around a million and a half dollars. Um, but <clears throat> and that was next to the fund balance, so it wasn't assumed as other operating revenue. That's correct. Okay. Um, and then on the uh, for the ACO, um, what outstanding settlements are you expecting? You know to come in because we're, you know, we're hearing um, most of the hospitals are getting some favorability from the past and just how are you accounting for that? And when do you expect to receive it? And is it, in, do you have it flowing through any of your financial statements? Sure, so uh, the settlement that I think you're referring to is the 2020 settlement. Um, and for that year, uh, we were only in the Medicaid program. So okay. there are two pieces of settlement uh, with, or, or there are two pieces of risk in the in the Medicaid program. Uh, it is the fixed payment program with regardless of what your claims experience is, your fixed payment is your fixed payment and you win or lose. Um, based on how those funds come into the organization, we um, we post that winning or losing reward risk into our budget on a monthly basis. Um, and so for us, that was about a million and a half, two million dollars that uh, would have come through in our 2020 financial statement. What we have outstanding is about 1.1, 1.2 million dollars that we have not taken um, as um, a, a, any type of um, revenue or posting in our financial statements. And that relates uh, to just the cost of, of care, the spend outside of our four walls for primary care and other providers of services in our community. Um, we have not taken that into account one, because we've not validated it and it's it's not final. Um, and two, we're not exactly sure um, how as a community we're going to bring that in um, and support other efforts, whether um, it be um, care management, uh, community health, um, home health and those types of things. Um, but first and foremost, we're waiting to validate. We have uh, open dialogue with One Care um, on that. The other piece is we don't have any 2022 risk budgeted in our um, in, in our in our financials. Um, and as you can see, uh, we thought that was 2.7. It's 4.3. Um, we're feeling a little uncomfortable at that level. Yeah, and you may maybe you just put that up on the back. You know, when you get it in, just kind of offset that uh, for potential risk or something. Right. But we, you know. First yeah. and foremost, we have to agree to the number. Um, right. I mean, not the 4.3. I mean, they, you know, what you're getting potentially back might be able to offset the future. 
Um, and I appreciate your comparisons to 2019 for NPR, and I, I think that's you know fair to look at it that way. Um, I also think when we're looking at the balance sheet. Um, going back to 2019 or, you know, what would be maybe a pre-pandemic period um, is important as well. And, you know, looking at your your cash um, back in 2019, it was $145 million compared to where you think you'll be in 2022 of $193 million. So up, you know, 33%. And similarly, in your fund balance, uh, about 220, moving to 273, so up 24 percent. So it, it certainly appears that your balance sheet is probably the strongest it's been in years. And um, you know, how, how should we think about you know that change from 2019, kind of the pre-pandemic period, to to where we sit right now? Sure. So um, that balance sheet, I, you, you heard Dr. Gregory, you heard Betsy, uh, you heard Claudio talk about just the strength and our ability to fund programs um, to entice and incent uh, staff to sign contracts for travelers. Uh, but, but first and foremost, it gives us the ability to come to you with a break-even budget. Um, I think that it could be you know, it's not without the realm of possibility that we're going to lose some money. If you look at our past performance where we've budgeted two and a half percent and we're just eking out bottom line, um, I, I think that that could happen. And so uh, that balance sheet is there and we are utilizing it to make changes and to make um, decisions going forward. And it is because of that growth that we came to you with a break even budget. Yeah, and I, I definitely appreciate that. I'm sorry, are you going to go, Claudia? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah so, I, but I also want to, uh, and, and you know and you've seen hospitals, independent rural community hospitals, the tides can change very, very quickly. Um, we, in our strategic planning focus, we, and we're always evaluating, are we stronger, uh, in the, as an independent hospital, or should we be joining onto a, a system uh, or collaborating more closely with other organizations? Um, and we made the decision organizationally, our leadership and governance and, and, and so forth, that at this point in time, we feel we are stronger and more responsive to our community needs as an independent hospital. That's not a one and done, that's something we continuously evaluate, but there are fewer and fewer independent community hospitals out there, and there's no safety net for Rutland Regional. And you've seen, we've seen in Vermont, hospitals that have been historically very strong on operations and with very strong cash reserves and very strong balance sheets change very quickly. And in this uncertain time, um, we don't think that, you know, we think it's prudent and important for us to have a, a decent balance sheet to be able to fall back on because we are in the middle of the pandemic. We are not, we are far from out of this and the future is, is very uncertain and very challenging. So that's, you know, kind of our position on why we would say, hey, listen, this is important. It helps stabilize operations. It helps us be responsive um, and it, it, it helps us mitigate uh, costs that we would pass on to uh, the, the consumer on that. Yeah, and, and just the last point, Maureen, um, if you look at our uh, age of plant, you can see that year over year we're aging. Um, and our plant has been you know, here for a long time and the delivery of care and patient flow uh, demands are changing as we're seeing more patients present from an outpatient perspective as an inpatient. We've got $2 million set aside in our 2022 budget for this, but that's really a drop in the hat, right? And so for us to be really efficient, uh, it is likely that we are going to have to reinvest in this plant to really drive quality, drive patient access, and lower costs. Um, and that's what our balance sheet does for us. So. Okay. Um, and just looking at the cash flow, um, the 2.5 million in the pension funding, and then the talk about the future focus of annuitizing the defined benefit program, you know, do you see that 
2.5 million continuing in the future? Do you see a big adjustment to any changes in your pension plan? Right. So um, if you look at our pension plan right now, uh, we are considered to have a model plan. We are about 105% funded, which means we have more assets than we have projected liability. Unfortunately, in order to place that in an insurance market, the insurance company takes on risk, so they want a premium. Um, and so we're predicting that we're going to need to be funded at, at about 110%. Um, this two and a half million gets us to that uh, level of funding, which allows us to go to the insurance market to annuitize uh, one time. Um, when we do this, though, you will see an impact, and I think you saw this with Southwest, where we have an unrecorded liability that's sitting in our net assets that we're going to have to realize. Um, yeah. and will obviously disclose and work with all interested parties in that, uh, but but that's that's where we're at. Okay, all right. And do you have any timing of when that that would have to be done? Would that be next year or I mean, twenty three? Um, it could be a twenty twenty two. We are uh, just in uh, the early phases of investigating, and we'll be reaching out. Obviously, we want to place this debt in a highly rated insurance company, and we want to do our due diligence, uh, and we have to price it. So. Okay, great. Um, okay, got, moving to the income statement. Um, can you discuss the new revenue recognition and the impact on 21 and 22? Um, yes. And I guess I think, also, do you think this impacts other hospitals? Uh, I guess, can you just talk a little bit about the net change? Sure. Um, and so this is a very highly complicated, um, really anchored and generally accepted accounting principles. Um, but uh, suffice it to say, it is a regulation we are required to follow. In its simplest terms, in its simplest forms, what the change is, is it basically takes any bad debt or free care that was related to a claim that had some type of insurance on it. So we're talking mainly deductibles and, and copay. Um, and based on this new reporting standard, we have to report that write off, whether it be an, an anticipation of bad debt or free care as a, a reserve linked to the primary payer. And so what it effectively does is just reclassifies this lost revenue, if you will, from bad debt and free care up to uh, a, a payer, up to uh, a reserve. Uh, we will be implementing this as of 2021. And so you see that coming in in our projection and you see it coming in in, uh, in 2022. Was it just like a million something? Did, wasn't there some net impact though? Yes. And so uh, when, again, highly complex, but when we looked at these models, uh, the models uh, determined that uh, we had about $900,000 of reimbursement through uh, payment of uh, deductibles and co-pays that we hadn't anticipated. And so we brought that in as revenue. So that increased That's our that increased our net revenue. In 21 or 22? In 21, and then we reestablished uh, what those payment percentages are going in 22. Okay. Um, and then can you talk about utilization expectations from the two, 2021 projection to the 22 budget? I mean, you've done a bridge that talks about it to budget, but that's fairly, that's obsolete at this point. So can you can you talk about utilization assumptions from from those two periods? Yeah. So um, if you were to look at our 2021 projection and compare that to 2022 budget, uh, there's minimal increases in revenue. I, I think it's less than three million dollars. Um, so what we're really saying is that we believed our 2021 activity is going to present again for 2022, um, and what that was predicated on was a little bit of sluggish inpatient volume um, and where we said we were behind. We've looked, um, you know, and we're, we're up now um, and the ED utilization is up. Um, but with that is all of the cost of labor. Um, and so we hadn't anticipated these highly 
costly incentive programs or the uh, continued increase in travelers. So they're really offsetting each other. Okay, because that is a concern, you know, I have just looking at your financials, the change from the 267 uh, net P NPR and the 21 projection going to 270 for 22 when so, your rate increase is, is over 4 million of that. So everything else would either be. So if I were to rewrite the projection today, Maureen, based on uh, the volume that I know, the net revenue would go up by about $6 million for 2021 projection. But my expenses are going to go up by about $7 million. Okay, but but that would be a concern. So if your 21 projection is at 267, are you saying it may end up coming in at 272? Somewhere in the neighborhood, yes. Right, but then next year would the budget is down, so it would be down to 270. And if we were doing a bridge, we know there's rate increase in there of over 4 million. So that would be utilization going down Right. So, so that's the challenge in this budget, right, is yeah. wait, what's the base? And you heard Dr. Gregory talk about overcrowding in the o, uh, ED where we have, we have 25 patient rooms. At times we have 48 patients. Like how long can, that, can we sustain that? Um, you know, so will we sustain 2021 volumes in 22 at this level for the last couple of months? I don't know. We're saying no, uh, not by a lot, you know, a few a few mil a million dollars, but um, I'm I'm not sure we have the physical and the staffing capacity to do that. Okay. Yeah, it's just I mean we know what we all don't know what's going to happen. It just seems like if there was still pent up demand that's starting to come back, and that wasn't fully impacted in 21, you know, we'd be getting that in 22 as well. So it just seems like there's. Um, yeah, potential that you'll come in higher. So our facility is at capacity. Okay. Um, our OR utilization is near capacity. Our ED ut utilization is over capacity. Um, we are uh, looking at our inpatient beds and based on you know, the needs of those patients, um, we're holding in the ED uh, often, uh, can't place those patients on the floor. So um, there's there could be pent up demand, but this facility it really cannot support much more of that. Okay. And uh, my last question or comment is I, I know you weren't, um, you didn't fill out the chart uh, that the Health Advocates Office had, had requested and you talked about, you know, potentially getting some other data. And you might have heard from one of the prior ones. I mean, I'm really looking at all the data everybody submits, and you can, you know, do a gross to net reconciliation, you know, on payer type. Um, it doesn't break it out inpatient, outpatient, but it's kind of a consistent way to, to look at that. Um, and when I do that for Rutland, you know, pegging Medicare at one, Medicaid is 0.86, and commercial is is 2.14, which is uh, right now the highest of the four hospitals. Um, we've looked at. So that rate, you know, commercial relative to Medicare um, is certainly up there. Um, and, and I don't know if you have anything to add to the report you were potentially going to be receiving. And Sure. So um, that's an aggregated number. Um, if you were to look at uh, this percentage inpatient to outpatient, it would look differently. And then if you slice it by service, obviously looks uh, a yep. whole lot different. And so there's a great variation. Uh, we are working to try to uh, follow the Burns and Associates um, report that you all received. We're having some difficulty. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, where I have to really kind of come in on is that regardless of what these payment percentages are, it's not accumulating in our operating margin. And so when we're using Medicare as a proxy, unfortunately, Medicare isn't covering costs. And so we all talk about it um, around, you know, the, the subsidy and the fact that Medicare and Medicaid aren't paying costs and what are we doing about it? Um, and, and that's very true, and we need to continue to engage in these conversations. Um, but that is where we're at today. Are we trying to do things to 
lower these costs? Absolutely. You know, reinvesting in uh, patient flow and care redesign, looking at labor management practices and the like. Um, but it is it is difficult, and it it all hangs together. You can't look at one metric without another. But no, I, I, I agree, yeah. and it, it's it's extremely complicated. And I wished it was easier to get our arms around. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And and I know, you know it. Is Something to the other thing in there is efficiencies and things like that. I mean, it, it is a benchmark to be able to compare certain things. It's an yes, it's an aggregate level, but um, you know, looking at that relationship, you know, is, is an indicator. Um, so, it, it, and also, okay. I would I would posit that we also need to look at the the bigger picture of the community we're serving. Um, you know, socioeconomically challenged rural um, wide service area that, you know, we as an independent not-for-profit community hospital are, are serving, it, you know, it drives some of that. And our position is somewhat unique in that, um, you know, we staff a true intensive care unit. We could lower some of those costs by not providing an intensive care unit it would be a huge disservice to the population we serve and a huge burden on our colleagues at Dartmouth and UVM who would have to pick up that thing. And quite frankly, people would not get the care. So there are some things that we are doing here at Rutland that are somewhat unique as the second largest hospital in Vermont. But when you look out outside of Vermont, we are a small rural community hospital serving a underserved um, socioeconomically disadvantaged community. So I think we also need to look at that uh, frame as we look at some of these. Yeah, and okay, Claudia. I would just add to sort of bulwark the example that you just gave. Um, these are fairly complex issues. And for example, around the provision of critical care, UVM and Dartmouth uh, right now don't have much capacity, if any, depending on the day. And the other piece that we rarely talk about in, in forums like this is we don't have the ability, uh, in many cases, to get patients there. So the EMS system in this state is strained to the breaking point. And so even when we have patients that have critical care needs that we can't meet here, we are regularly cobbling together uh, a plan to serve these patients and their families. So it's just, it's a much bigger problem than, you know, merely what is what services are offered at any individual um, institution in a state like Vermont. Okay, thank you. I'm all and set. Just, um, Thanks. just on, the, on the efficiency though, um, if you were to look at efficiency today, you look at our income statement and it looks like we've got a million and a half uh, a dollar deficit in, in staffing. But if you look at the efficiency, we cannot ask our staff to work uh, any, any harder and accept any uh, greater assignments than they are now. It really is looking at those labor pressures and retention and recruitment and finding employees to come work for us and work for every other hospital here in the state. Great, thank you, Maureen. And uh, next we're gonna turn to board member Holmes, Jessica. Thank you, um, and I want to thank you for the very thoughtful presentation and clearly all the work that you're doing in Rutland um, to serve our communities. It's obviously just hearing your voices and hearing you talk about what's happening in capacity and trying to serve our patients in this pandemic is, um, it's, it, I know the work that you're doing and I feel gratitude for it. Um, so, and I worry about the next few months, I'll be honest with you. So, I, I you know, my worry is being shared. Um, I will say, Judy, as, as a one board member, I really, I think I, I do appreciate the look at NPR growth based as it's on the 2019 base. Um, I actually think that's the right approach. I think it smooths out the low volume in 2020 and the high volume in 2021. So I appreciate the way you presented that. Um, I'm thinking about the, the, I had some questions about your projections, um, and so Maureen asked them about what they are for now for 2021, and it sounds like they're higher than even expected when you presented your budget, which is actually similar to what the other hospitals we've heard from with the volumes. 
Um, and I'm wondering actually in particular with, with Rutland as the second largest hospital and with patients north of Rutland experiencing access issues, particularly in the areas of specialty care and imaging, I'm wondering if you're seeing an increased flow of patients from Middlebury and other areas down into Rutland that you wouldn't otherwise expect. This is not just pent up demand from your community, but actually it sounds like from what I'm hearing in my community that there might be some overflow going down your way. So I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to that and how you see that going forward. And is that in the projections and the budget for 2022? This is from maybe more new information. I'm just wondering how you're thinking about that. This might be a little bit for Dr. Gregory and a little bit for Judy. Yes, I'll let Dr. Gregory start and then I'll follow with the numbers. So I think the short answer is yes. I think the complicated answer is um, sort of maybe or we're not sure. Um, so we certainly are seeing folks that are outside our traditional catchment area. Um, and we're also seeing patients that we're fairly certain are from far outside our catchment area, but that have now local addresses listed. So uh, real estate in our area, like much of Vermont is very tight. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, and we believe, although it's very hard to prove this, especially you know, uh, given the short timeline um, that this is uh, evolved under, that these are probably patients from uh, outside Vermont state that have relocated to Vermont because of COVID and are now contemplating making this a, a permanent residence, maybe. Um, so they have, you know, addresses listed in Killington and around. Uh, they appear to be from Vermont state as far as we can tell, but many of them, you know, are from New York or New Jersey or Massachusetts. And so it is a, 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 an amalgamation of, you know, Vermonters from outside our catchment area and then sort of new new Vermonters maybe um, from from far beyond. I guess my, my subsequent question then would be, are you going to continue to track that? So to the degree that you're serving newer populations next year when we look at the NPR growth, it'll be helpful to understand that some of this was, you know, you're serving populations that you don't traditionally serve. So if NPR growth is higher than expected, in large part, it may be due to that different volume than you anticipated rather than, you know, pent up demand in your own community. So, And that is certainly within our capabilities to track as it is one care. Um, and so uh, not to forget that many of these patients uh, could be enrolled in uh, the one care programs and we'll get the reporting there as well. Great. Uh, I also just wanted to note that I really appreciated the low change in charge request. Um, it particularly made at the expense of achieving a positive operating margin for next year. I think that was uh, very thoughtful to the communities that are, you know, suffering from high costs and, and uh, potentially lost jobs and all of that. So I wanted to uh, note my appreciation for that. Um, you mentioned in the narrative that in setting, and actually in your presentation as well, in setting your change in charge request, you reviewed some of this data from the Act 53 required reporting and, and you looked at the price transparency website. I'm just wondering what you learned from that exercise, because I've certainly tried to do that. I've gone on to some of the price transparency websites. It's very difficult to learn much from those and to navigate them. Um, and Act 53, of course, is charge master. So I'm wondering, as somebody who's much more in the weeds on charges, prices, uh, you know, what you learned from that exercise. Sure. So um, I will agree, agree with you entirely. The pricing transparency is very difficult uh, for anyone to go in and try to draw conclusions who does not have some in-depth knowledge of, you know, hospital price setting. Um, it, it's it's difficult. Um, we worked in major themes. Uh, we looked at services. Um, we had um, had a concerted effort for a number of years uh, to to look at lab. Uh, so we knew that uh, that was an area where we uh, probably uh, looked really favorable compared to other hospitals. Um, and so we began uh, looking at that level. Um, the Act 53 data uh, proved more beneficial uh, than the pricing transparency. Uh, we leveraged Act uh, pricing transparency when we thought we needed something deeper from Act 53. 
Um, but uh, first and foremost, inflation drove a good portion of our rate increase um, because we set our charges based on acquisition cost. Um, and when we're seeing that inflation, primarily in our uh, pharmaceutical spend, also within our medical spend, you know, that is, uh, you know, a, a foundation and a factor. So. Okay, great. And actually, if you could, that my last question involves um, the inflation and your slide 20. Is it possible for you to pull that back up? I think it would just be easier for everybody if we had that slide up. Is this what you were referring to? Yeah, that's great. So I know this is a this is actually a new uh, request of the hospitals to fill in this table, and I think from looking at this that perhaps there was some misunderstanding in parts of it, which I can walk you through. But I think my interpretation. Um, but before I do that, and I'm really just doing this so I can understand better, but also so we can go understand going forward kind of what this table is supposed to be uh, presenting. But if I look at this. Um, if I look, for example, at the wages and medical staff, I would interpret that as on average, your medical staff is going to get about a 2% uh, wage increase and your non-medical staff is going to get a 6% wage increase on average, wage compensation increase on average. Is that the way I should correctly interpret that? It is, yes. Okay. Um, so 6% for non-medical staff, is that driven largely by uh, market adjustments, by the labor market shortage, by uh, realizing that, yeah, you know, maybe your, your market wages haven't been keeping pace with other hospitals for non-medical staff? Yes, so uh, half of that is a correction to our 2021 budget, where a year ago we came to you thinking that uh, we were in good standing with retention and recruitment, and uh, we actually were considering not giving any market increase raises to our staff. Um, and then COVID hit and all of the labor competition, the market pressures, um, we knew that we weren't able to um, live up to uh, that, that plan. So half of that uh, inflation increase uh, relates to a market adjustment that occurred in December of, of last year. Okay, helpful. Um, and so then drugs, obviously this is the average price of drugs, drug drug acquisition for the hospital is you know growing at 6%, medical supplies on average acquisition costs are rising, prices are rising 8%. Contract staffing, the average wage that you pay your contracted labor is doubling. So, um, yeah, that percentage, uh, there's a piece of it that is utilization as well as rates. Um, but I, I think that if you look at, um, you know, we're, we're paying in excess of $120 an hour. Uh, we were down somewhere in the 60, 70 range prior to COVID. So uh, that's probably more of the percentage you're looking at there. Okay. Um, so we are trying to keep it clean of any volume you know, utilization, any of that in this, but that's helpful. And then the other insurance, self-insurance, does that mean that there is an increase of 3.5% on claims costs that are not being passed on to employees through premiums that Rutland is now taking on an additional 3.5% of the growth in claims cost for its self -insurance population that it didn't before? That is correct. So yes. it's not being passed on to, okay. Um, and then, okay, and I understand the retail and 340B program, that is with the assumption that um, going forward, some of these manufacturers are dropping out. And so now the prices that you pay for 340B are going to be, or those drugs are going to be higher because you're not getting the discounts because of non-participating pharmaceutical companies. Yeah? Is that right. right? Okay. Right. Perfect. Okay. That's really, really helpful to me. Thank you for walking me through that. I just wanted to make sure. In the third column over, uh, this is where I think there's a, a misunderstanding. Um, the third column over is supposed to be the percent of that that uh, that line item in the overall budget, not in the uh, the percent of the second column. So, for example, I say that because for contract staffing, the one million dollars there, from my looking at your um, expenses, it's less than two percent of your overall expenses is in travelers and contract labor. So it's not eleven percent, although I recognize it's eleven percent of the nine million, right? I think. So I just want to say the third column is supposed to reflect 
what is the percentage of that category in the overall operating budget? Yes, so this was um, a schedule we actually had a little bit of difficulty completing and we worked with um, the staff um, at, at, at the Green Mountain Care Board. So we'll we'll go back um, and, and figure out how you, you want it reported. I think sure. there were a couple of different ways. Yeah. I understand that, yeah, and because it, it's, it's a way of getting an understanding of the weighted average of, of you know, each of these uh, bucket components into the overall budget and by how much, you know, each of those uh, component parts is growing. And so the way I think about the $9 million, which is your total inflationary growth in your uh, $290 million budget. So I think of 9 million, 9.3 million, sorry, my glasses are 9.3 million out of 291 million basically is, is explained by inflation. And that gets you to about 3.2%. So 3.2% of your overall expense budget is driven by these inflationary pressures, which to, you know, to um, the 3.2% is about on par with what we're hearing from other hospitals. So when I, when I do that calculation, I'm, I'm trying to figure out then how do you get to 7%? So I'm, I'm just trying to understand, is it from this table or is it from some other table? I see nine out of the 291 million as inflation. And so that's about 3.2. Uh, so, uh, I cited a different number. Um, so oh. if we were to look at the net revenue uh, that we gain from each percentage of rate increase, which is about 1.2, and you divide that by the 9.3, that's that's where I'm, I came up with the 7% number. Okay. So to some degree, that's reflecting cost shift as well. Right? I mean, so th your point about the 7% would be what we would need to be what we would ask for if we really wanted to cover all of our costs, that is also taking into account the fact that your um, rate request is not going to fully cover your cost because it's not going to apply to all of the payers. Is that right? Or am I, am I mixing well, what, what too it's bad? Really, what it's really implying is that uh, with inflation, uh, some of that is supported by utilization growth. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That was helpful. I really understand this. And I'm happy to chat with you offline about this table and how we can make it clearer um, sure. going forward. Yep. I'd love to do that if I can do that. All sure. Right. Happy, happy to have that conversation. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Jess. Next, we're going to go to board member Lunch, Robin. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Claudio and Judy and everyone else who uh, really did a very thorough job on your budget submission. Um, all of my questions were either answered by your submission or were asked by Jess or Maureen. So I'm all set. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. You're helping to get us back on schedule. Board member Pelham, Tom. Well, I'm going to be helpful in that regard, too. I mean, three, three of Jess's questions were exactly the ones that I have written on my yellow question sheet here. Um, and uh, so I, I'm actually just down to two. Um, um, you know, um, Cla Claudio started this pr presentation by saying um, that it might be a little bit too conservative. And as I kind of look down at the context of the 2022 proposed budget in the context of the 19, uh, the 2019 to 2022 trend, I would have to say um, there would be a strong argument for a higher charge increase. The um, for Rutland, the uh, over that that period 2019 to 2022, the NPR FPP trend has been 1.72 percent. The total operating revenue trend has been 1.8 percent. The total operating expense has been 2 percent. And this year they're proposing uh, no operating margin. And I, um, I appreciate Jess's question of, about applauding that in terms of kind of keeping that pressure uh, at, at, at minimum on, on the, the charge pressure. But I'm wondering why the decision wasn't made to, um, say, request a charge of 4.6%, which would give you uh, one and a quarter million dollars uh, into operating margin. So you're not committing it to anything. It's just there. Um, you know, in, in your operating statement for uh, and helps buy you time 
that that you think you need to kind of figure out what your strategic plan is, given all the turmoil in the in the in the system. Um, why not just bank this money and have it available uh, you um, and in your base for uh, future consideration of of what your strategic plan might be? Yeah, Tom. Uh, you know, we are concerned about our community and the businesses in our community that are already struggling. Everyone is struggling during this period of time, and we did not want to add any more burden if we did not have to. Um, we figured we could go another year with a flat operating margin. And given all the uncertainties that we are facing, again, we wanted to come in with a conservative yeah. budget. So that makes sense to me, and it's, and it's a very kind approach. Uh, I, I, I could see others making uh, not making that same decision. Um, so I applaud you for that. The, o the only other question I have that um, might be embarrassing to me because I should know the answer, but I was looking at uh, the payer mix table and again, looking at the 2019 to 2022 budget trends. And um, the Medicare trend is uh, over those years is, uh, and this is a NPR FPP, not gross is 1.99%. And then the Medicaid trend is a 15.7%. Uh, Medicaid goes from 19.7 million NPR FPP in 2019 to 32.6 million in 2021 projected and 30.5 million for 2022 budget. And the commercial trend is less than, is, is actually a negative one tenth of 1%. And I feel like I'm missing something because I, I read your statement about um, the issues with cost shifting from state and federal programs continues and requires we raise our rates by 3.6%. But then I look at these trends and I, I, I don't see the cost shift in your payer mix table. So a um, lot of numbers there. I'm certainly willing to um, work with you and kind of put together a schedule that will address address your question if that's helpful. Um, I'll tell you from a high level, we're not seeing uh, major shifts in um, in payer mix at all. What we are seeing is a shift to the ACO. So I'd want to make sure that we're interpreting those fixed payments um, and the way that that is accounted for uh, accurately um, in your numbers. So certainly willing to work with you. But um, yeah, well, I, I would I would pre pre that appreciate that because I just want to make sure that. Uh, I'm on solid footing when I'm I'm kind of looking at this, and I do think that the uh, FPP numbers uh, that 49 million is in is in this table. So, uh, spending a few minutes just to straighten my straighten me out on on uh, uh, so, you know, would be helpful. Thank you. Yes. Other than that, yes. I'm I'm good to go. Thank you. Thank may, you, may I just just make a comment, just uh, uh, Member Pelham? Um, you know, thank you for your recognition of of our efforts. We're we you know we are still trying to to manage the cost and and you know the three legged stool of quality access and cost. We're trying to make sure we're keeping those aligned. However, you know we also have benefited from years, as I say, stated in the outset, of strong financial stewardship. And we've also benefited greatly from federal and state relief here in Rutland and a, and a finance team led by Judy and folks that were able to maximize our ability to get that. That played into our ability. I don't know as if we're any more uh, kind or um, altruistic than any other hospital. Everybody is in a different situation in our state and our colleagues are all you know, one of the balancing acts that is becoming a lot more tenuous and challenging is, you know, we need to be there for our communities. We're not helping the communities if we cut costs so much that we are not able, they're not able to access the care that they need. So, right, it's, it's, there's a calculus there that there's uh, the science of it that you're really trying to work and, and you've helped us uh, be more focused on that, but there's a little bit of an art to how we try to balance that for each individual community. I just wanted to to, to make sure that, um, th and those decisions, uh, you know, I've been in Vermont for 13, 14 years now, those decisions get harder every year for, for all of us. Yeah. 
Well, I, I appreciate that. I, I think in the long run, what goes around comes around. And, uh, you know, you've, you've, uh, you've taken a, um, a disciplined approach with your budget and um, haven't, I, I think there would have been some additional running room there, which you make the choice not to go after. And I think that's, that's to be applauded and, and the hospital should be applauded, you know, in, in your community for not uh, pushing to raise it, your charge your charge rate as high, high as you might have. Thanks, Tom. So um, this is probably not the appropriate uh, setting for me to make the, the statement I'm about to make, but I'm going to do it anyways. <laughs> and um, Dr. Gregory, I want to uh, congratulate you on your new position. Um, you have some big shoes to fill. And I noticed that uh, Dr. Boynton was on the line at least earlier. And uh, I just want to make sure that I give a big shout out to your predecessor, who um, was always there when we had questions. And he was very helpful to the board. And uh, it even predates my time here at the board. Uh, I remember bringing him as a witness to a, a Senate Health Care Committee meeting. So, um, Dr. Boynton, if you're listening, um, the members of the Green Mountain Care Board are very appreciative of uh, everything that you've done for us as far as answering questions. And uh, um, we hope that Todd will follow in your path and uh, be as open to uh, our sometimes crazy questions that we might throw his way. Thank you, and I'll make sure that uh, Mel gets those kind words and thoughts uh, if he's not still on. And I want to reassure you, I will do my best to support the board. <clears throat> Super, thank you. And, Mel and says thank you. He's relishing in the thoughts. So thank you for the kind words. <laughs> and and, and uh, Chair, Chair, Chair Mullen, we're not letting uh, Dr. Boynton off the hook entirely. Uh, we are using him, again, as we're trying to drive the efficient and effective operation of our growing uh, medical group. Um, you know, what what Dr. Boynton has done with the Vermont Orthopedic Clinic is a great model of effectiveness and efficiency and throughput and taking care of patients and doing it in a very effective manner. And so we are looking at that. We're also looking at the cost of care. And Dr. Boynton has worked and been been working very closely with Judy Fox and so forth, where we're trying to get a better um, cost accounting type a data system so that we can now look at all the uh, inputs of the cost of care and try to make sure we're driving that. So uh, the the role has gotten too big and, and Dr. Boynton is also a full-time orthopedic surgeon with a very busy practice. So we've kind of bifurcated his responsibilities, had him focus on the, uh, so he is still having some uh, senior leadership and and uh, operational focus here. So you, you you can pull you can pull him back if you need to have him testify again too, along with Dr. Gregory. Super. And Claudio, that kind of leads into my next question because um, I guess it was four years ago that you came in, not you, but your predecessor came in um, seeking the CON for the new building, which is now the Hube. And I was curious if. Um, the efficiencies that uh, um, were um, being offered at that time as far as um, bringing um, practices into um, own space rather than lease space, the efficiencies of having better designed um, rooms for patient care and things like that. Have they been realized and are things going well with that new building? Uh, yes, they are. I was... Um... You know, I was a little bit concerned. I wasn't in on the design part of it, but it, it increases a lot of space. And so when you look at like the Vermont Orthopedic Clinic, uh, they did an amazing job transferring from a very compressed space to a lot larger space. They literally did the transition um, in a weekend. They, they closed the clinic for like a Friday and the following Monday or Tuesday, they were back up and seeing patients and they quickly redesigned their care processes and so forth to be very effective and efficient. Um, and the other, so I, I would say, yes, um, we don't have on the top floor, we don't, and it's also benefited from integrating uh, our physical medicine uh, clinic and service, co-locating that in with the Vermont Orthopedic Clinic. So there's been some benefit there. And uh, 
the the other thing is on the top floor of the clinic where we have our uh, e ENT service, um, we could be busier up there. We have two open positions for ENT specialists that we've been recruiting very heavily on uh, and don't have those filled. So um, it's not it's not by the design of the facility. I think it's because we haven't been able to replace some retiring folks there. But we've also been able to reallocate, get out of some leased space that we have and reconfigure some of the administrative space. So we're cutting down some of that overhead on the lease. So it, it, it is working as intended. And uh, Betsy, I want to say that we share something in common. I too was born at uh, Rutland back when it was Rutland Hospital. And I'll tell you that uh, I'm probably a little older than you. So um, my parents always referred to it as he was born at the new Rutland Hospital. Um, but when you look at your age of plant and see that it's above all your peers, um, <laughs> it just shows you how old I am when it's now uh, in that uh, situation. Um, and Claudio, my, my statement here, um, is more as a concern of a, of a community member than as a board member. Um, because I want that hospital to be around until I pass away um, as well. And I look at the, the last several years, and this isn't something new that I've, I've been harping on, but your expenses grow faster than your revenues. And, um, you know, I, I look at that growth from 266 to 290, almost 9%. And I know that uh, you're facing some pretty tough situations, but you also have the disadvantages. I get to see all the positive things and all the, the blemishes as well. So I do worry at times when I see the swag or the community sponsored events or, you know, things like a, um, retention bonuses. I know that, that the frontline staff needed it. I'm not so sure that the administration needed it, but I get it. Um, Every single position is important to the operation, and I know uh, you have to do what uh, you have to do. But, and you know, when I talk to community members, including doctors at uh, Rutland Regional, they all kind of refer to uh, Judy as the Grinch, and and uh, I think she's doing her best to uh, keep those expenses from growing. But they're still growing faster than um, what is sustainable for the organization. So. Um, just, just want to throw that out there because um, I do care about the hospital that I go to, and I, I want to make sure that you're around for a long time. And uh, I know that it's it's very hard making expense reductions, but I think it's something that you always have to continue to uh, work on. And um, Betsy, you talked a lot about um, the efforts that you've done as far as um, recruitment and retention and one of the small pieces I noticed recently was um, allowing um, those that were in the defined benefit pension um, to continue working um, and still be able to uh, draw down on the pension. Did you get any take up on that? Was that a successful tool? Judy, I'll kick that to you. I'm not I'm not aware of any. Of the, the retention from the payment, is that what you're referring to? No, Judy, I, I saw uh, an email that went out that said that now um, someone who was eligible for the old defined benefit could uh, continue working and still start to draw down. So it's basically a, a move geared towards retaining some of those older um, employees. And I was just wondering if there was any success from that at all, because it might be something that others could learn from. Yeah, so um, we did that because there was a request of a, a couple of individuals. Um, and so I can't tell you it was significant, uh, but certainly we had a handful of individuals who had retired, wanted to come back, work on a per diem basis, and this allowed that to happen. So Good. I mean, it's nibbling around the edges, but anything that we can do for the uh, workforce, it's just... I've never seen a workforce crisis like the one that we're in now. And Claudio really nailed it on the head when he talked about how other businesses could reduce hours or, you know, reduce services, but you can't. So um, that's something that uh, I know you continue to try to uh, innovate on, but it's something that 
unfortunately you're going to be working on for several years to come and and uh so you know i look at um your days cash on hands are good your your uh days receivable are very well managed um you know you're i i do have concerns when you um don't budget for a, a better margin um but I think you're doing the right thing. Um, unlike my colleague, I don't think 3%, 3.6% is a low um, charge increase, but um, it's low compared to your peers this year. And so that I guess we can uh, be thankful for, but um, that was really it. I just wanted to uh, get out there that you know, every year we still see expenses growing faster than what your revenue is. And, and over time, that's not a sustainable path. And, and, uh, so I'll just have that on the record at this point, I'll turn over the, the questioning to the healthcare advocate. Good afternoon, everyone. I know we started in the morning, now we're in the afternoon. Um, just wanted to thank Rutland for all the work that you've done and continue to do for Vermonters during the COVID-19 pandemic particularly during this recent surge um, and uncertainty with the Delta variant. Also want to highlight um, and commend Rutland for hiring a population health director and their collaboration with the community-driven approach, as you mentioned. Uh, I think it's important for addressing structural determinants of health, lines with Vermont's blueprint for health. Um, as I mentioned briefly, and I'll, I'll try to keep my questions brief because I know we're close on time. Um, Obviously, there's disproportionate impact of BIPOC for monitors with COVID. Um, so a lot of our questions, as we submitted in the pre-hearing um, memo that we that we submitted, have a racial racial equity focus. Um, so with that, our first question is: How much funding in your current and future budget has been allocated to DEI and a racial equity focused projects, trainings, or collaborations? Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Uh, Betsy, do you want to take that, or Judy? Yeah. So I think in previous years, we've budgeted for certain consulting fees around 25,000-ish. Um, but I will say that uh, all of our leaders and staff have participated in implicit bias training um, throughout the this past year and the previous year. Additionally, we also have um, cultural competency uh, education built into all of our orienta orientation materials, um, as well as our rapid regulatory, which is our an required annual education. Thanks a lot. Do you have a sense of what percentage of staff and administrative leadership have completed those trainings? Uh, so I would say about 100% of leaders have completed the implicit bias training, um, and it's probably equal or close to that with with all staff uh, giving take you know per diems um, and those types of employees. Okay, thanks. Um, what percentage of staff would you? I guess I'll just go. Kind of Jump around here. I know we're close on time. Um, what languages are your just switching over to patient satisfaction? Um, what languages are your patient satisfaction surveys available in? And do you collect race or ethnicity data as a part of the survey? Sure. So we do collect uh, race information. Uh, we're in the process of implementing collecting ethnicity information. Uh, we use Prescani as our vendor. Um, Currently, all of our patient satisfaction surveys are sent in English, uh, but we do have the capability in working with Prescani uh, to have it available in 52 languages. Um, and we're working on how we collect that information in the registration process and how to funnel it to Prescani so they send the appropriate survey. Okay. Thank you. Uh, last question, switching topics a little bit. We did notice a drop in the ratio of free care uh, to over GPCR from 1.22 in 2019 to 0.74 in 2021 projected. So we know this analysis accounts for an overall decrease in utilization. So I'm just wondering what do you think drove this trend and were there any issues with patients' ability to utilize free care during the COVID shutdown? Yes, so that is uh, merely a, a change in practice, and that's related to the revenue recognition standard that we talked about earlier, where we've reclassed any free care or bad debt uh, related to encounters that have an insurance. Uh, so what you're seeing in the free care and bad debt amounts now are just truly uh, individuals without any payment source, so truly self-pay. Um, and in terms of free care, 
Uh, we did everything within our power to uh, keep communication open with our patients, which included uh, sending free care apps to all uninsured individuals. We looked at individuals uh, who had high copays and deductibles, uh, sent uh, applications to them. We also extended uh, for a period of five months the free care application where they could apply and had no time limits to the uh, number of claims and the aging of those claims that would be considered for free care. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Back to you, Chair Mellon. Thank you, Sam. Next, we're going to go to public comment. Is there any public comment on the RRMC uh, budget hearing from any member of the public? Hearing none, I want to uh, thank the uh, four of you for uh, a very thorough presentation. And uh, um, we really appreciate everything that uh, you are doing and will do in the future. And, and uh, Claudio, I do want to say that I was uh, proud to see that Rutland was always at the forefront of the numbers of the, the vaccination rates. And uh, the operation that you set up at the Holiday Inn was truly impressive. And um, let's hope that we're going to reap some rewards from that uh, those efforts and we won't see what happened in some of the other states quite as severe here. So thank you all. And with that, I'm going to put the Green Mountain Care Board meeting into recess until 145 when we will take up the NRVH budget. Thank you, everyone. Have a good lunch. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you all.